If you haven't been with us, and a number of people have been coming back from holiday and trying to catch up with things, we've been going through a series kind of utilizing some truth claims about who God is and helping them to diagnose our own hearts, using them as tools to diagnose our hearts and our souls so that we can take care of our souls. Because the reality is we need to take care of our souls. And all too often we forget All too often we don't even think about it, and then we begin to feel the pain all too late. So in the first week, we looked at Psalm 27, which helped us to see that that God is great, and so that we don't need to try to control everything. We can trust in his sovereign control. We can trust in his plan. We can go to him first whenever we are in crisis. Uh, That goes against often what our natural selves want to do. Then last week with Dave, we we looked at Psalm 94, which helped us to remember that that God is good, that God is good, that he is is good in, in all that he does. He is excellent in all that he does, and therefore he is sufficient for all things. He's sufficient for us. He's sufficient in the good times. He's sufficient in the hard times, even whenever we can't see it. And he does all of this for his good and for our good, and for his glory. And today we're going to be looking at Psalm 31. So if you've got a Bible, now's the time to turn to Psalm 31, where we're going to be thinking about God being glorious. Over the course of this year, I've, I've seen more and more clearly that, that my soul, that my heart doesn't always work for God's glory. That, that my heart is seeking to glorify myself, in many ways. Too often I'm, I'm seeking to glorify others, to lift others up so that they would ultimately say, well, Chris, you're amazing, and glorify me. Because the problem with us as human beings is that we're glory stealers. We're glory stealers. We're continuously trying to seek approval from others. We're continuously trying to be recognized for what we do. We just have to think about the workplace. Constantly seeking that affirmation, making sure that our our managers know that we just did that thing for them. And whenever we don't receive that, we hate it. We hate receiving rejection or even the potential of rejection. We detest it. And so if you're ever worried about what other people think, if you're ever seeking approval from others, you need to know that God is glorious and that only he matters. God is glorious, and only he matters. That's, that's the truth statement that we're going to be digging into this morning. That's the truth statement that is going to take care of our souls going forward, remembering that God is glorious, and only he matters. You see, whenever we crave the approval of certain people, or whenever we fear the rejection or the potential of rejection from people, we are fearing man. We are people pleasing, we are submitting to peer pressure, we're essentially elevating people above God. Throughout the Bible, countless times, particularly in the book of Proverbs, uh, God speaks to this fear of man issue, and he says it's dangerous. He says it's dangerous. Proverbs 29, 25 is a clear example. The fear of man lays a snare. It is a danger to us. But whoever trusts in the Lord, whoever fears the Lord, is safe. You see, fear of the man ultimately ignores Jesus. It ignores Jesus as the most glorious one that has ever existed and ever will exist. And instead, it places people onto pedestals. It places ourselves onto pedestals where we seek to glorify others and ourselves. So we need to understand that God is glorious and that only God is truly glorious. And maybe that, that term glorious is a term that you've heard of countless times. You, you, you've got a, an idea of what it means, or perhaps you don't. And it's a new word too. That, that term gloriousness literally means a, a heaviness, a, a weightiness, a, a, something of substance that we can feel, that we can see, that we can perceive. It's the, it's the cloud that came into the tabernacle. It could be seen, it could be felt. It's the song of all creation in Psalm 19. And so today, just as we have been over the past two weeks, we're going to slow down. We're going to slow down and take stock 
of what our souls are chasing after. And we're going to reorientate the eyes of our hearts to focus on the awesome glory of God. And we're going to do that by using Psalm 31. And so why don't we read this together? In you, O Lord, I do take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and you guide me. You take me out of the net, out of the snare that they have hidden for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who regard worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of my enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street, they flee from me. I've been forgotten like one who is dead. I've become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many terror on every side as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I, I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love, O Lord. Let not me be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me which, uh, when I was in a besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help. Love the Lord, all you saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. Be strong. Let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Let me just pray for us again as we dig into this heart issue. Heavenly Father, we thank you that that you speak such glorious truth, that you reveal who you are, that we may see you, that we might perceive you, even though we can't perceive you in all of your fullness, all of the fullness of your glory. Lord, I pray that this morning we will be able to see that you're most glorious and that our hearts will, will be transformed by the renewing of our minds, by your Spirit's work, that we might be able to diagnose the, the sinful issues in our hearts and let you, the glory of your name, the glory of who you are, saturate our lives so that we are transformed for your, your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. So the question we have to ask is, why is it that we fear man? What is it that, that makes us fear man? Uh, imagine with me, you're in your car, you're on your daily commute to work, or you're traveling to the shops, whatever it might be, and you're, you've got your coffee in your hand, you've just enjoyed, uh, the windows are down, uh, the sun is shining, and you, t- you hear a song on the radio and you, you turn it up, or your Spotify playlist, you turn it up, and you know, you, you start getting into the groove, you start kind of tapping the, the steering wheel, uh, you, you start maybe shimmying on, in your seat, you start singing quietly and gradually getting louder and louder, uh, to the point where you're just like singing, like you don't care who's there, you're just singing your favorite song at the top of your lungs. And then we all know what happens, it, like, it takes a moment uh, the, the traffic lights ahead turn red. You, you slow down. You're kind of still in the middle of that chorus that you, you really love. It's coming to that big 
that big note, and you want to keep on singing. But as you slow down, you notice someone just to the left and the right, uh, and you, hear them, you, you see them looking at you. They can hear you. What do you do? What do you do? Um, it's happened to, to me too many times. Um, and I kind of just slump back in my seat, turn the radio down again, get the coffee back, and just pretend to be it wasn't me. Um, why is it that we get embarrassed over such trivial things? The person to my left and right, I don't even know who they are. I'll probably never see them again in the rest of my life. And yet, in that moment, I'm ashamed. In that moment, I'm embarrassed. Uh, Joe and I, a couple of weeks ago, we went out for a date night to Red Rocks just to watch the sunset. It was beautiful. We were sitting on a, on a big rock just a few meters from the path. Um, and as the sun set and people were starting to leave, uh, there, was, there was a group of maybe four or five teenage girls, and they were walking towards us. They didn't see us. Uh, and on their phones or Bluetooth speaker or something, they had a Katy Perry firework uh, playing now. I remember that years ago. These teenagers would have been like three or something at the time that that came out. So that's not the embarrassing part. The embarrassing part for them was they were all singing. They were all singing as they walked along this path. And it, it was good singing. We were enjoying it. It was like a final little uh, uh, song to, to help us on our way. But as they neared us, literally they were as close as, as the front row is to me. We were just sitting on this rock up here. They, one by one, they gradually noticed that we were sitting there. We tried our best not to look at them. We were like, just like trying not to embarrass them. But one by one, they, they stopped singing until it was the last girl. And she, was just, she just kept on singing and realized everyone around her had stopped and then realized why they had stopped. And she felt scundered. She felt so embarrassed. I don't even know if that's a word here, scundered. I don't, I don't even know. Um, it's, it's a Northern Irish thing. Um, but she felt so embarrassed. She went red in her face. They all giggled and like walked, like they sped up a little bit more. Uh, but it was, it was fascinating just to see people's reactions. Again, we're not going to see those girls again. If, if she's ever watching this sermon, you're famous. Um, like, it's, it's great. That's, that, that's the start of your fame. I, I'm sorry, but... But it, it's, it's fascinating how we become embarrassed over such trivial things. It sounds silly, but why is it that we get embarrassed in these moments? Why is it that we feel that shame in these moments? Well, the world around us that calls it peer pressure, it calls it people pleasing. And we get embarrassed whenever we don't do it. The Bible calls it fear of man. And so today we're going, to, we're going to seek to understand fear of man. We're going to seek to understand how God's glory, who God is, overcomes fear of man in our hearts. Because it is a dangerous disease for us. Now that idea of fear, we have an understanding of what fear is. I've got a fear of snakes. Um, I don't hold them in any respect. I hate the things. Um, but I've got a, a fear, a phobia. Fear of man doesn't necessarily mean a phobia of something. What it means is that, we, we have, that we're afraid of them in a sense of awe, in a, in a sense of respect, in a sense of, of holding someone into a lofty position, of, of being controlled by them, of being mastered by them, of ultimately worshipping them in, to some respect, of putting your trust in them. Fear of man means putting your trust in other people, in needing other people. I may be getting caught in the car isn't going to embarrass you. Maybe you love that sort of attention. Um, but maybe there's other symptoms that helps us to see where fear of man comes into our lives, where, where we seek to elevate other people above God. So let me just rhyme off a number of potential symptoms that you might experience in your day-to-day -day life. Have you ever struggled with peer pressure? Have you ever overcommitted? Have you ever felt the need to, to I need to say yes, I can't, I can't say no to what people are asking of you? If you do that, that's representative of fear of man. Do you, do you need something from your spouse or, or a really good friend? You, you need them. You need them to listen to you. You need them to respect you. And if they don't, you, you feel aggrieved. Unless, in, if it's a spouse, unless you live out um, and understand the biblical parameters of marriage, your, your spouse or, or your friend is it's gradually going to become someone that controls you, that masters you. 
It's going to become one that you fear. And gradually over time, that person may even take the place of God in your life. You look to them so much. You hold them up in such high regard. Is self-esteem a a critical issue for you? Because self-esteem is one of the most popular ways that the fear of other people is expressed as you begin to compare yourself to others. Do you ever feel exposed? Do you ever feel like you're an imposter? And you you fear that idea of being exposed as an imposter. That sense of being exposed is an expression of fear of man. Here's a a big one that I know many of us, including myself, struggle with. Do you always second guess your decisions? Do you always worry what other people might think by your decisions? Are you afraid of making mistakes because of what other people might think about you? Does that hinder you from taking risks? Does that hinder you from stepping into things for fear of what other people think? I'm like, amen, yes, that's me. Do you ever feel empty? Do you ever feel meaningless? You need others to fill you up. You need others to love you. You need others to to show affection and affirmation to you. If you do, you're controlled by that need to be filled up by others. You're controlled by others. Do you ever lie? Do you ever do those kind of small white lies just to make you look a little bit better? Just to make you look as though you're, you're a better person, your, your life is better than it actually is? Covering up whole truths with half-truths, hiding in the, in the gray, in the shadows? Are you jealous of other people? If you are, you're controlled by them. You're controlled by their possessions. Do other people make you angry? Do other people make you depressed? Do they make you go that little bit crazy whenever they they speak to you? Are you frustrated by them? If so, it's probably that that person has a controlling stake in your life. Do you avoid people altogether? Do you shy away from people for, for fear of what they might do? Because if that's the case, you're still fearing those people. You're just not putting yourself in the position before them where they they control you, but ultimately you're still controlled by them. You're still controlled by that fear. Even even today's fad diets, even whenever they are in the the, the intention is for, for health purposes, intrinsically, aren't they all about kind of what other people say about you? Aren't they all about impressing other people? I, I, I've loved it in the past when people have said, hey, Chris, have you been working out in the gym? Have you lost some weight? Rarely happens, but sometimes it has happened, and, and I love that. And, and we love receiving kind of praise from, from people, don't we? We love receiving praise from people. And that's one of the ways that we exalt others above God. We do things to receive people's praise. We love it, and we crave it. And for many of us, we, we, we know the pain of this all too much. We, we've, we've been nodding along as, as we've heard each of those symptoms going, oh, wow, that, that's me. But, but maybe you're the, the odd one out who, who hasn't yet heard something that relates to them. Maybe you haven't heard something that quite hits the mark. So we'll continue. When you compare yourselves to others, do you feel good about yourself? Oh, I'm glad I'm, I'm not like them. And whenever I say others... That could be anyone kind of in your life, in acquaintances. But how often do we look at reality TV shows? How often do do I watch something like Modern Family on Disney Plus and and go, I'm glad I'm not like them. Their life's a mess at times. Or there'll be times I'm thinking, oh wow, my life's a mess compared to theirs. I'm comparing myself to other people. I'm elevating them to a place. Whether they're in my life or on the TV, I'm elevating them to a place in my life that has a controlling influence. What about this? When you hear the call to evangelism, how do you feel? When you have an opportunity to to share your faith, are you fearful of what those people might think about you? 
The fear of man is a plague that paralyzes the heart. It's a plague that paralyzes the heart. And as I hear those questions and as I've been mulling over them over the past week, I'm struck by just how often my heart chases after things. It chases after affirmation from people. It, it chases after that praise from people and it is terrified by rejection. It is terrified that I will be rejected for, for what I say, for what I do, for what I'm like as a person. And sometimes it's, it's easy to see these things in our lives and, and blame it on our personalities. We can say, well, that's just the way I am. It's just the way I've been brought up. It's just the way I was born. I was born to fear man. Or we can place it on our circumstances. But sometimes it's so deeply entrenched within our hearts that we can't even see it ourselves. It's like a giant tree that has heart rot. Right in the inside core of that trunk, the lifeblood of that tree is, is disintegrating. Unknown to the outside world, until a point when that tree collapses under the weight of itself. And it is only then, upon that breaking point, that we see the full extent of the damage that has been caused. Ed Welch is, is a, a writer, a Christian writer. He's a psychologist. He's, he's written a great book. I just want to highlight this book. If you felt the fear of man is, is something that you struggle with, and so I imagine that's going to be all of us to some shape or form, I would encourage you to read this book. When people are big and when God is small, I read this a number of years ago and was blown away by it. And I would encourage anyone to read it. I've been reading it over the past uh, few weeks and it's, it's helped me understand a little bit more fear of man because I'm so quick to forget. I'm so quick to diminish. But one of the things that he says is the fear of man is such a part of our human fabric that we should check for a pulse if someone denies it. The fear of man is such a part of our human fabric that we should check for a pulse if someone denies it. And so if you don't think fear of man's been an issue for you, can you just check your pulse now for us and get someone to raise their hand next to you as soon as we can get some medical attention? But at its core, the cause of our fear of man is, is that we fear to be truly seen for who we are. We fear being exposed. Uh, we fear being rejected. We fear being threatened. And we see, if, right at the start of the Bible, in Genesis 3, God has created everything that is good. Adam and Eve reject God's word. They eat of the fruit that they were told not to eat of. And at that moment, sin enters into the world. As their heart responds, sin enters into the world. And what's the response from that? They feel ashamed and they hide. They feel ashamed of being exposed and they hide. They, they cover their nakedness, which was not a problem to that point. They enjoyed the beauty of all of those things until sin entered the world, until shame entered the world. And they hid. They hid themselves and they hid from God. They feared being exposed. They feared being rejected. They feared the threat that was to come from God. It all starts right there because of sin. That's where fear enters into the world, that, that fear of man. And guys, we're still hiding today. We're still hiding today. David felt it in, in, in the psalm that we're looking at. Look at verses 11 to 13. <clears throat> he says, Because of all my adversaries, I've become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street, they flee from me. It's fear of man right there. I've been forgotten like one who is dead. I've become a broken, like a broken vessel, for I, am, I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side as they scheme together against me as they plot to take my life. He's speaking mostly of, of friends, of those who were acquaintances, of neighbors, of people who were close to him. And in a nutshell, they're unkind to him, they're shy of him, they flee from him. And some of you know that pain. Some of you know what that feels like when something has been said about you, 
whether it's true or not, and, and people give you a wide berth because of it. Some of you perceive it to be the case, even when it's not the case, and you hide for fear of, of exposure, for fear of rejection, even whenever what you perceive is not a reality. Those who, who should have spoken up for David, his friends, his neighbors, those who knew his character, knew his integrity, they're the ones who were so quick to represent him differently, to represent him ultimately to King Saul, David's adversary, differently, because they wanted to gain favor with that person, with the person who had power. They wanted to give glory to that person and be seen as useful, as glorious to them. It's fear of man all over the place, and ultimately it's causing lives to be at stake for they plot against him, even for his life. And here's the age-old problem. When we exalt people above God, when we perceive that their power to be above God's power, when we perceive that they have a godlike gaze on our hearts, when we perceive that they have a godlike ability to, to fill us, what we end up doing is, is chasing after them rather than chasing after God. When we believe that they can give us all of the love that our soul needs, all of the affirmation, all of the admiration, all of the acceptance, all of the blessing, all of the respect, all of the things that we so crave, we lift them up, we make them as idols, we put our trust in them, we believe that, that they have the power, that they have the ability to give us something, to bless us, to give us what we so desire. And so what do we do? We, we give them glory. Now, we don't think of it that way, but by fearing them above others, by, by giving them that mastering control over our lives, we give them glory. The world around us has changed from Genesis. The world around us has changed dramatically from that point onwards. But our hearts, our hearts that have stayed the same. Our hearts have constantly been chasing after things that bring us glory. And as a result, with fear of man idolatry, as with all idolatry of any kind, what we choose to worship owns us. What we choose to worship owns us. It controls us. The object that we fear, it, it overcomes us. And what we may at first glance see is just superficial, just insignificant. What we may at first glance just decide is normal. Everyone does it. It begins to enslave us. It begins to lead us to the point of thinking that we have no way out of this. We have been mastered. We have been enslaved to the degree that we, we have no hope. And the, the sad reality is fear of man leads people to death. Spiritually, people feel it, but there is countless deaths because of fear of man. That is how dangerous it is. It is, it is a plague that, that paralyzes us from doing what is, is good and what is right, but it's a deadly disease that defeats us, and it's a serious sin of the soul that needs a solution. And so today, our, our prayer, my prayer, is that we find that solution, that we discover what is the solution to fear of man. And it, it's, a, it's a simple one to say. It's a simple one to say. The, the solution to fear of man is to know that God is awesome, to know that he is glorious. It's plain and it's simple. But yet it's something that we need to hold on to. It's something that we need to truly know. We can see it in action in David's response. Look at verses 14 to 22. In light of all that he's just said about his friends, his, his neighbors, his adversaries, those who flee from him, those who are plotting to put him to death, if fear of man was a massive issue for him, that would be, that would be what causes it. But David says in verse 14, but I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. At times, uh, my times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me, from, in, your, save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to show. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak insolently against the righteous in pride and contempt. 
Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. And in the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in the shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord. You're glorious, God, for, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love for me when I was in a besieged city. I said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight, but you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried out to you for help. You see, David knows the Lord. David trusts in the Lord, and, and, and that's what we must do. It's as simple as that, but, but saying that, just trust in God. It's easy for me to say, but it takes us to, to step out with faith, but with active faith. We can't just sit here and go, yeah, I trust in God. We need to actively pursue him in order that we might have knowledge of the Lord, in order that we might have trust in the Lord, that that might be known to us in our minds, but also lived out and experienced in our hearts in the day-to-day mundaneness of life. And so I've, I've come up with a, a soul care treatment plan to help us. It's not exhaustive. Uh, there's plenty more that you will be able to add to it over the course of your life. Uh, but just a couple of things that will help us on the way to, to overcome, to be cured, to be liberated from fear of man. Uh, anyone who's read Hebrews, Hebrews 3, is, is a brilliant passage of Scripture. And, and the writer of Hebrews in, in that chapter, he exhorts us in, in the first two verses to consider Jesus. He exhorts us to consider Jesus. All of the things of who Jesus is, that he is glorious, that he is all the things that he has done. Consider Jesus. Then later he calls us to take care. Take care. Lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away. A heart that is, is captivated by other things, by other people. And then he, we're told to encourage or exhort one another as long as it is called a day, so that each of us might not have a disbelieving heart that is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We have to be a people that spend time considering Jesus. David's able to say, oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you. He's able to say that because he has considered, he has meditated, he has focused on the Lord. He knows the Lord. He trusts the Lord. He knows his faithfulness. He knows his love, his steadfast love, his abundant grace. He knows his mercy. He knows his help. He knows his refuge. And in comparison to all other things, he knows that the Lord is glorious. I've been pondering over the last few months, what is it that prevents me? What is it that hinders me, that hinders us from seeing the Lord as glorious and awesome, deserving of our unhindered praise and glory and honor and worship. And as I've reflected, part of it has been a lack of, of, of deep spiritual disciplines. Studying Scripture, meditating on Scripture fervently, deeply, enjoying studying the Bible. Maybe even for some of us, knowing how to study the Bible has been a difficulty. And we want to get into that more. We want to deepen our understanding of it. It's been not able to pray dependently, trusting in God in the first instance. And we've been thinking about that over the past few weeks. Often, God is, is the last person we come to. We have to ask the question of our hearts why that is. And then in, in line with that has been our underappreciation of the, of the severity of the magnitude of sin in our lives. We diminish it. We, we just don't realize how sinful we, we truly are. We aren't repulsed by sin. And because of that, it makes, whenever we look to Jesus, whenever we do consider Jesus, we diminish actually the, the glorious honor and sheer wowness of what Jesus has done, of what he deserves. Our glory, our honor, our praise, forever and ever. He deserves all of it for for taking, hey, just my sin. 
just my past sin, just my, my now present sin, my, my future sin. But he's taken it on all of, all of us who trust in him. Guys, we need to, as we consider that, that needs to blow our hearts out of the water. As we, as we come to the, the, the communion table each week, we should, we should come with, with, with tears of, of joy and of wonder of, and of like appreciation of great gratitude as we acknowledge that enormous sacrifice that Christ has made for us because it was truly glorious. It was truly enormous. So we need to actively pursue. We need to actively pursue and consider the knowledge of God so that we can know in our heads and we can know in our hearts that he is glorious. And perhaps that's going to take time for us. Perhaps that's going to take us writing down the the things that we have seen, the evidences of God's grace, the goodness of God in our lives that we can see and perceive. As we study scripture, we just keep on memorizing and meditating on the things that show that he is glorious above all. Read through the Psalms. David does it countless times because he, he knows it's true, but also it's good for our hearts, good for our souls to remember these things. <clears throat> so grow in the knowledge of the Lord. That's, that's the first part of the treatment plan. The second is praise God for being God. Praise God for being God and not just because of what he's done. Notice I say not just It is good to praise God for what he has done. But we should praise God for being God. Because when we just praise God for what he has done, what we end up doing is kind of Christianize an idol of our own salvation. And and that forces us, that brings us into this, this kind of thought process of, well, I must have been somewhat good enough to be chosen by God. I must have been somewhat special enough for God to to save me. The reality is that God loves us. He saves us because of his own sovereign pleasure and for the sake of his own glory. We have done nothing, not one thing to deserve it. And his glory is even greater when we realize that. His glory is even greater when we realize that he didn't need to save us. He didn't need to love us, but he does. The people of Israel, as they come out of the the land of Egypt, uh, a passage of scripture that we know all too well, as they come across the Red Sea miraculously, as they sit on the far shore of the Red Sea, they sing a song of praise to the Lord. In Exodus 15 verse 11, they say this, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders, They praise God for being God. They praise God for being God. Have a think. When was the last time that you just sat and praised God for for who he is in your prayer time, in your quiet time, when you, you didn't ask for circumstance change, where you didn't ask for help for yourself or others, you just spent your time in awe and wonder of him. Our souls need to spend more time being overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the glory of God. We need to spend time daily in the cover of God's presence, like the psalmist says, for that cures fear of man. But to be liberated from it, to be freed from it, we need to understand what our hearts are chasing after. We need to understand ourselves and we need to understand those needs in relation to who God is. Larry Crabb is a Christian psychologist in the States and ultimately he says, we all long for what God designed for us to enjoy. Tension-free relationships filled with deep, loving acceptance and with opportunities to make a difference to someone else. Sounds nice. Sounds, Sounds nice. That's what we need. That's what we long for. And then he says, for that to happen, each of us fervently wants someone to see us exactly as we are, warts and all, and still accept us. So just look around the room. Is there anyone in this room that you are wanting to fully show your whole self to? 
as you maybe look around the room, perhaps you start to feel that, that barometer of fear of man just increasing that little bit more. Every ounce of your being exposed. Fear of what they might think. Fear of, of threat that they might reject you and leave you. The reality is that deep down, we know that these longings cannot be met by, by anyone in the room. We're all lovely, good people, but they cannot be met by anyone in the room, and they can't be met by anyone outside this room. Our greatest needs and our greatest longings can only be met as we acknowledge God, as we consider Him, and as we worship Him. The Westminster Catechism is, is a, a short question and a response to, to help uh, people memorize uh, truths of the Bible. And in the very, very first question, it is answered this way. The, the chief end, the, the purpose, uh, the, the fullest longing of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That is, that is our soul's deepest longing. That is our soul's desire. And it brings us full circle again. We aren't to fear men. We aren't to give other people glory above God. We are to fear the Lord. It comes back to Proverbs 29, 25 again. The fear of, the man, fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts or whoever fears in the Lord is safe. And we do that by, by looking to Jesus. We do that by considering Jesus, for he is the glory of the Lord, the radiance of the glory of the Lord that is displayed before us. We see his glory displayed as he, as he comes down from the heavenly places, from the, the glorious throne room of grace, of heaven itself, in, in fullness of communion with the Father and the Spirit. And he humbles himself to come to the earth, to dwell with us, to dwell with us. He humbles himself from there and comes to us. The glorious God, he dwells with us and he lives in perfect obedience to God. He lives a life of fullness. He calls people to himself that they might know the Lord, that they might trust in him, that they might enjoy the salvation that he offers. And that salvation is, is eternity with him. It's not like escape from hell. It is eternity with him. It is that, but the, the, the good thing, the exciting thing, the glorious thing that we get to uh, be part of is eternity with him. Let that be a delight that we chase after. And to make that happen, the, the Lord himself was, was lifted up. He was glorified. He was raised up upon the cross. He was glorified in, in what was perceived by others, by those who didn't give him glory, to be the most shameful, the most brutal, the most torturous way. But he was glorified because in his death, he was winning that decisive victory, that decisive victory that wiped out fear, that wiped out shame, that wiped out sin, guilt, and death itself. And in Luke's account of that crucifixion, in Jesus' final breath, Luke records from eyewitnesses that Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus speaks what we have just read at the very beginning of Psalm 31. Jesus is the refuge that cannot be overcome. He is the stronghold that cannot be overcome. He is the deliverer who will save us from the snare, from the net. And he is the redeemer who pays a price for our sin and shame. He is, he is all of those things. He is all of those things. So we just come to him and we just submit our souls, our spirits, our everything into the Father's hands. But that's not just an individual thing. That is, that is a corporate thing for us as a church. We need to be a body. We need to be a church that, that is overwhelmed, that is smitten by the glory of God, that is committed 
to the unity of the church, building one another up, pointing each other each and every day, as long as it's called today, to the glory, to the excellencies of Christ. We need to be a church that is swept away by the love of the Lord. And we need to faithfully walk together in obedience to him in the good times and in the bad times, in the hard times. And we need to need other people less. And we need to love other people more. Out of a response to his glory, not, not seeking to receive glory from others. And as we do that, as we step into that, we're going to be living a life of, of daily repentance and faith, repentance and faith, repentance and faith, because we will mess that up at times. We will fall into fear of man at times and diminish God and raise ourselves higher than him in our hearts. But as we do that on a daily basis, as we live a life of repentance and faith, seeking to glorify him in all things, over time we will gradually be able to repeat in our own way, in our own words, the refrain that David starts this psalm with. It will become a mantra for our own lives. And we will be able to say, in you, O Lord, I do take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me. A fortress to save me. I'm glad I don't go to those other things anymore. For you are my rock. You are my refuge. And for your name's sake, you, you lead me and guide me. I, I don't need to look to other people to, to do that for me anymore. I look to you first. You've taken me out of the net that the people hide from me, the snare that people put before me. For you are my refuge. And so, Lord, into your hands I commit my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Let that be the mantra of our lives as we commit our, our lives to him, as we trust in the Lord, as we seek him first each and every day, as long as it's called today. Let what we know in our minds um, guys, we, we do know this in our minds. We talk about it. We talk about it a lot. But let it saturate and fill our hearts and souls so that we can really know, truly know that he is absolutely abundantly glorious, that he is worthy of everything in our lives, every part of our lives. That is the Lord that we should fear. That is the Lord that we should have awe and wonder about. That is the Lord that we should feel terror, that we should tremble before, because he is glorious, not man, not people. And so friends, I pray that this morning, as you mull over this psalm and, and countless others, as you read through Proverbs in your own quiet times and you come across these verses on the fear of man, that as you contemplate your soul's fear of man complex, that you come and see, that you come and marvel at the Lord, at the beauty of the awesomeness of his, his love, his, his mercy, his justness, his faithfulness, his holiness. And as you do that, that you humbly accept, that you realize that his affection is over you, that he is the one that, that does know everything about you, he knows the good. He knows the ugly. He knows the warts and all. He knows all of those things. And he says, you are my beloved. You are my beloved. You are my beloved. All of you are my beloved. You trust in me. David knew that. His prayer was, make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. We want to see the glory of the Lord more readily. And so we pray that just as Moses did, just as David did, that we can see that God will show us, that God will open our eyes to the fullness of his glory. So let us just take a moment. Let us just take a moment to consider Jesus, to contemplate these things, to do business with God, perhaps to repent, to perhaps ask the Spirit's help to overcome what is rife in our lives, to, to pull away the, the plague, the disease, 
that is rampant in our hearts and to actively enjoy and delight in the Lord. Let's just have a moment silent as the band comes back up. Lord, would you make your face shine upon your, your servants? Lord, would you show us your glory? Would you let us know your steadfast love for us? Would you let our hearts know that we are loved? Not by virtue of anything that we've done, or haven't done, but by virtue of who you are, of your sovereign, glorious desire. Lord, help us to be a people that gaze upon the wonder of the Lord, that, that look to you and are just, wow, Lord, I pray that we do that in our, in our daily lives. That we do that ourselves, but we also encourage and exhort others to do the same. And Lord, as we, as we live that out, as we work that out, as we consider Jesus day by day, Lord, I pray that you will help us to rejoice. That we will rejoice because of your glory. Lord, will you heal us? Would you heal our hearts? Would your spirit overcome the, the decay, the plague, the disease that runs rampant within us, that chases after people, that chases after things, that gives glory to those things instead of you? Would your spirit today cleanse us of all unrighteousness? Lord, we come before you humbly. We ask for your help. We ask for your forgiveness and we pray that you will do a mighty work within us for your glory and for your name's sake. Amen.